Just picking you some flowers. The bridges of Madison County. You pretty drunk? Not really. Leaving Las Our Vegas. You are a toy. Toy Story. What do these three films all have in common? Well, they're movies that Gene or I, or both of us, think the Academy Award voters should not overlook when they mark their Oscar nominating ballots, which are arriving in their mailboxes this week. And on this annual show called Siskel and Ebert's Memo to the Academy. That is exactly what we're doing, providing free, unsolicited, and very sincere advice about work that deserves to be honored at Oscar time. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Sisko of the Chicago Tribune. And we have been accused every year when we do this show that people say, you're trying to influence the Academy Awards. Right. We're guilty. Right. We're happy to be guilty. Each week on Sisko and Ebert, we try to reach out to all 8 million of our weekly viewers. You, you, and you. Not today. Today, we're interested in an audience of only 5,000 people, the 5,000 members of the Motion Picture Academy. Let's start by reminding them who they should nominate in the Best Actor category. The likely nominees, the sure bets, are Michael Douglas in The American President, Anthony Hopkins as Nixon, and John Travolta in Get Shorty. For the remaining two slots, I'd like to suggest, first and foremost, Sean Penn in the just-released Dead Man Walking, playing just the kind of character who rarely gets nominated, a low-life criminal convicted of murdering and raping two innocent young people. He's sentenced to die, and Susan Sarandon plays the nun who seeks to comfort him and help him get his sentence commuted. Penn spends much of the film working with only his face and voice as he talks to Sarandon while incarcerated. A limiting position for an actor. Where'd you go yesterday? They wouldn't let me come back. You all right? Yeah, I'm fine. I could have asked somebody what happened. Nobody tell me anything. Clean. You didn't know? I thought you had a heart attack Man, or something. And they told me they were going to tell you what happened. And then they took me out of the room and tell me why I was weighing me, measuring me. Measuring? Yeah, see how big a coffin I need or something. Oh, I hope this picture is screened widely and attended and that Penn's fellow actors will rally to his excellence. This is a tough role, playing a creep we're supposed to care about. And now here's a coincidence. My other choice for a leading actor who should not be overlooked is David Morris, an actor I'm sure you don't know, appearing opposite Jack Nicholson in The Crossing Guard, a film written and directed by, of all people, Sean Penn. Morris plays another criminal, a man just being released from prison for killing a little girl in a drunk driving accident. Nicholson plays the girl's dad who wants to kill the guy, and you tell me who does the better, more subtle acting job in this confrontation scene. When the thing happened, I wanted to be dead. But there wasn't, you know, I didn't want your forgiveness. I had a problem with parts of the crossing guard, but nothing to do with David Morris's characterization, which is a wellspring of remorse and guilt. And you know, if you can outact Jack Nicholson, well, I think that's worth an award all by itself. The name, David Morris, in Sean Penn's The Crossing Guard. I think both of your choices are very good, and especially Sean Penn, because he's dealing here with a character who is a real, worthless, low-life, murdering scum. And he's also a racist, and he's ignorant, and he doesn't probably have a very high IQ, and yet, at the same time, he is a human being. And the way that Sean Penn is able to create this character so that we... We don't forgive him, yeah. but we can see him as a human being in the same way that Susan Sarandon is able to, is a really ennobling experience. I'll say one other thing. I've had problems all the time with Hollywood actors using Southern accents. Mm -hmm. All that, they go way over the top. This one seems authentic to me. Okay, now in addition to your names, the actor I hope the Academy doesn't overlook this year is Nicolas Cage in Leaving Las Vegas. Here is an actor who has specialized in taking chances over the years, who has worked hard and well in a lot of good films, and here walks a tricky tightrope in one of the toughest roles for an actor to survive, a drunk role. The danger is you'll either go over the top and the performance will turn into comedy, or you'll bottom out and the performance will turn passive and depressing.
Cage finds a middle way, the right way, somehow suggesting the indomitable spirit that still lives within this man whose life is so unmanageable that he has decided to end it. You are Lou. What? What? You've been drinking all day. But of course. Speaking of drinks, here is yours. Down that hatch. And uh, here's mine. Cheers. Come on. There we go. Yes? Let's do it to it. And you can feel him just about to explode blowed there while he's trying to seem jovial and happy. Of all the great performances showing alcoholism in the movies, I think Cage's work in Leaving Las Vegas is the best. He's right up there with Albert Finney from Under the Volcano, Ray Milland in The Lost Weekend, and Jack Lemmon in The Days of Wine and Roses. And the movie is filled with melodramatic traps that could have damaged a lesser film, but Cage and his colleagues triumphantly bring off a story that is operatic in its emotion and tragedy and yet very real in its details. It is a great performance. I, I think it is a great work, and I've been championing this guy for his whole career, mm -hmm. for risk-taking. Uh, an actor, frequently, when they have a high profile, wants more than ever to be liked and hold on to his audience. He won't play unlikable roles. That has never been an issue with Nicolas Cage. He will take risks both in the performance, in reaching for a role, mm -hmm. and also in the kinds of role and he's taking. And if you looked at his entire work in one big film festival, you would find less to bore you and disappoint yep. you than with anybody else. He's a else big talent. Generation. He deserves to be nominated. Coming up next, our recommendations for Best Actress, and I pick someone who already has two Oscars. It's our annual show called Memo to the Academy, where we call the attention of the Academy voters to great work we hope they will not overlook. Yes, we are trying to influence the Academy, and in this segment, Let's look at the Best Actress category. My guess is that there are three names that are pretty much certain to be nominated. Annette Bening for The American President, Nicole Kidman for To Die For, and Emma Thompson for Sense and Sensibility. Now, one name I hope the Academy doesn't overlook is Susan Sarandon, who is incredibly strong in the year-end film Dead Man Walking, which Gene just talked about in terms of Sean Penn's performance. The movie opened late. I don't know how many Oscar voters are going to get a chance to see it. I hope they go out of their way to get to a screening, though, because this is the kind of work that ennobles filmmaking. There are some passages in there about when Jesus was facing death alone that you might want to check out. Uh, I think me and Jesus had a different way of dealing with things. He's one of them turn the other cheek guys. It takes a lot of strength to turn the other cheek. Another performance I hope the Academy voters consider in the Best Actress category is the courageous and powerful work by Elizabeth Shue opposite Nicolas Cage in Leaving Las Vegas, which we talked about earlier. Their work was the strongest one-two punch all year. She plays a Las Vegas hooker who meets Cage's character soon after he comes to town to deliberately drink himself to death. Something about him inspires her sympathy and love, and she becomes his redeeming angel. Ben, it's not about sex. I'm going to make you up a bed on the sofa. We're going to talk till late. We're going to sleep till late. As you know, I am my own boss. Watch Elizabeth Shue carefully here, and you will see not only a technical achievement, but a personal reaching out. She really gives herself to this role. And in a sense, both Susan Sarandon and Elizabeth Shue are illustrating the same virtues in their performances. Their characters become involved in the struggles of lonely, incomplete, doomed men, and they love them not in a romantic sense so much, as in the sense that one human being can empathize with the grief of another. Well, now you put it right on it. Uh, that's exactly right. Uh, it's not romantic movie love. It's love of an individual. And they are tested in a variety of ways by other people that they meet in the film. And their, their, their love and the sincerity of their love and the direction of their love. You know, what about the victims? What about normal people <laughs> uh, in Leaving Las Vegas? You know, why are you attracted to this criminal? That kind of attack they have to respond to as actresses, and I think that they do an exceedingly fine job in both roles. Normally, we try to highlight on this show smaller films, lesser-known stars, but my reminder selection this year for the Best Actress category is a two-time winner who did extraordinary work in a high-profile film that was released seven months ago. Yes, my pick is Meryl Streep in The Bridges of Madison County. The Bridges of Madison County was successful at the box office, but it wasn't a bigger hit, I think, because young moviegoers who can make movies really big hits couldn't relate to the loneliness of a middle-aged farm woman. But Academy voters, come on, reach all the way back to June. Remember June? <laughs> Meryl Streep created a timeless character, a woman ignored. And she did it much like a sculptor. She did it with precise gestures and looks, bold, silent strokes of behavior. 
please do not forget her. And she was wonderful in that movie, and the way she reacts to what's going on inside her mind is subtle, and it's, it's really touching. It's a touching, it's a good film. When we come back, we'll talk about deserving nominees in other categories, and also movies we hope don't get overlooked in the best picture category. A grab bag segment in our memo to the Academy, each of us picking from assorted categories other people we don't want to see overlooked at Oscar time. I'll start out with John Lasseter, the director of Toy Story. The director of an animated film has never been nominated, I guess because voters think there's nothing to assembling a bunch of paintings. But John Lasseter had to do much more than that with Toy Story. He had to supervise basically the invention of an art form, computer-generated animation, and then put some flesh, if you will, into lifeless toys. Take a look at the direction of this scene early in the film, where Woody calls a meeting of all the toys, each with a distinctive personality. What do you mean the party's today? His birthday's not till next week. What's going on down there? Is his mom losing her marbles? Well, obviously, she wanted to have the party before the move. I'm not worried. You shouldn't be worried. Of course Woody ain't worried. He's been Andy's favorite since kindergarten. What more did any director do this year than John Lasseter? Name one. You can't. He worked four years on this project. Also recommended the supporting performance, I guess it's supporting, of James Cromwell as the farmer in Babe. Magical yarn about an Australian pig that fancies himself a sheepdog. James Cromwell had to play opposite a pig for much of this movie, and he was absolutely charismatic in expressing the joy and love and astonishment he had for this talented little porker. I also want to suggest that Oscar's much embattled documentary committee give a second chance to Crumb, the amazing documentary about underground cartoonist Robert Crumb. In a true scandal, Crumb was barely screened by the Academy, which considered it last year before its commercial release this year. And finally, my last recommendation is for best original screenplay. I'd like to recommend Adam McGoyan's script of Exotica for a very specific reason this year. It's great. It's a convoluted yet serious mystery involving a man who frequents a sex club and engages the services of a table dancer played memorably by Mia Kirshner. I was just thinking, what would happen if someone hurt you? How, how can anyone hurt me? If I'm not there to protect you. This is a very provocative film, and in addition to its excellence, there was another movie released this year about a woman who entertained men with sex fantasies. That film was Showgirls, written by Joe Esterhaas, who was paid millions for his tripe. What a way to send a message to Hollywood. Nominate Adam Agoya's Exotica screenplay. I think all four of your selections are original. Thank you. And I think they're all good. And Thank I you. agree with all of them. I don't think they're going to go back. They'll probably cite the bylaws about Crumb. And uh, they but yet they have a new committee and the committee ought to be able to make up its own rules and it ought to be able to redress past damages. It'd be great if that committee decided to, to give an honorary Oscar in the documentary category this year to Hoop Dreams. And then or embarrass, take a look at it embarrass again. the Board of Governors. The Board of Governors say, oh, we can't have honorary Oscars, you're going to do this. And you say, the Board of Governors have been minding its business. Hoop Dreams would have won last year. It's time for you guys or to pay Crum. up. Or Crum. A case or can or be Crum. made that yes. Crum is because a better film than Hoop Dreams. Well, a case could be made. They Look certainly would both be on my best ten list. You got it. That way. Okay. Coming up next, my selections for more potential winners that the Academy should not overlook. Academy, where we suggest names we hope the Oscar voters don't overlook. Here are my choices of four more nominees in various categories. To begin with, I hope the voters remember Tim Roth in Rob Roy, where he gave one of the year's best supporting performances as the foppish Cunningham, a villain who steals money, blames it on Rob Roy, and who finally faces him in a sword fight. <laughs> In the cinematography category, I hope the voters will carefully look at the work of Matthew F. Leonetti in Strange Days, the futuristic look at Los Angeles in the grip of virtual reality. The film is an amazingly complex visual experience filled with atmosphere and doom, special effects, and unceasing motion, and the look of film noir. And Leonetti's work is breathtaking. In the Best Director category, and a Best Picture too, for that matter, I hope the Academy gives credit to Martin Scorsese's remarkable Casino. 
Here is a man who, by general consensus, is the best American director of the last 20 years, and he has never won an Oscar. It's time, and Casino is a virtuoso marriage of fact and fiction. Look at this place. It's made of money. What do you think about me moving out here? I just got to tell you, it's no joke out here. You got to keep a low profile. Right off the bat, they don't like guys like us. Go! Another nomination in the category of Best Director should go to Chris Noonan, who made the remarkable film Babe. It's hard enough to get good performances from human actors, but to combine them with animation, models, Muppets, and real live animals is a remarkable achievement, and Noonan did it seamlessly in one of the year's most entertaining films. Stay there. Excuse me, sheep. Hello, hello, good morning to you all. Now, a handicap faced by a couple of my suggested nominees is that they were not box office winners, not big winners, and a couple of others opened earlier this year. The ideal Oscar candidate is a blockbuster that opens in December, unfortunately. But I hope the voters will look back over the entire year and remember some of these achievements. A, a brilliant sword fight, a surreal landscape, a vivid docudrama, and a pig that thought it was a sheepdog. Those are all examples of the way the movies can continue to surprise us. Well, I want to endorse two of your recommendations. First, Tim Roth in Rob Roy. Villains make action pictures go. Mm -hmm. And the only reason we care about what Liam Neeson is doing because we want Tim Roth's character destroyed. It's a great <laughs> piece of work. And the other one is the director of Babe. Yeah. I talked about the director of Toy Story. This is the other project that comes out of nowhere, out, out of imagination. Yes. This is a great piece of work. This isn't story. It's not no. bestseller. It's not big stars. No. It's not big budget. It's imagination. Yes, directors, great work. I'd love to see them both nominated. Okay, coming up next, we'll each try to have an impact on the Best Picture of the Year nominations. It's always the most difficult Oscar category to influence. Best Picture of the Year. That's because we're fighting huge million-dollar ad campaigns and a certain clubbiness among Oscar voters. The certain nominees include Apollo 13, the American President, and Nixon. And they're all good films. But I'd like to recommend serious consideration of Toy Story for Best Picture. It breaks new ground. It's smart. And I think it has a great theme, a great movie theme, because I think it's really about American movies right now, a battle between the old-fashioned cowboy and the newfangled action hero. How dare you open a spaceman's helmet on an uncharted planet? My eyeballs could have been sucked from their sockets. You actually think? You're the Buzz Lightyear? <laughs> oh, all this time, I thought it was an act. Toy Story argues for cooperation between the two genres, westerns and science fiction, and against the darkness of the punk heavy metal mentality of that rotten kid next door. But clearly, this movie is mostly on the side of old values and old toys. Go for it, Academy voters. Nominate Toy Story. Admit it. You haven't seen anything like it before. You enjoyed it when you saw it. Face up to it. Nominate it. Best picture. Uh, it's a wonderful film. I agree with your praise of the film, but not necessarily with your analysis. I think that Buzz Lightyear is a pretty nice guy, and the movie isn't against him. And I think, basically, Gene, that kid next door that takes his toys apart and puts them back together again yeah. is the next Bill Gates. He's got creativity. He doesn't just passively play with little Mr. Potato Head. He takes his toys and sees what makes them work. Yeah. So he's Do probably more like us than you want to admit. Do you think that the film embraces old toy values? Yes. Uh, it embraces old toys, but old toys that have never been like this before. I mean, Mr. Potato Head never talked before. He never got married before. Come on. Okay. This is a new Mr. Potato Head. Okay. I think we've already pretty clearly indicated that we think Leaving Las Vegas deserves a Best Picture nomination. And so, having handled that matter a little higher up in the show, so remember, Leaving Las Vegas, I'd also like to point out at this point the remarkable film Dead Man Walking, which we have also talked about. Directed by Tim Robbins, this is one of the most intelligent and hypnotic films I've seen this year. Now look at this scene. We know these actors. We've seen Susan Sarandon and Sean Penn many times before, but they disappear into their characters until we forget they are characters. Look at you. Death is breathing down your neck. You're playing your little mad on the make games. I'm not here for your amusement, Matthew. Show some respect. Boss, I respect you because you annoying you with that little cross around your neck. Because I'm a person. Every person deserves respect. I'd encourage the Academy, please, seek this movie out. Please, look at it. I think you'll be amazed. Isn't it interesting that what we're doing here is asking Academy voters to see movies? And yeah. really good pictures. Mm -hmm. It's a strange situation because we all know that they often don't. And so what we're really doing is saying, treat yourselves 
to some great work that was made, particularly, I have to admit, at the end of this year. Academy Awards change history. When good work is awarded, it yeah. influences good work in the future. Don't just go to movies that you think will be fun on Saturday night after dinner. Go look at Leaving Las Vegas. Go look at Dead Man Walking. Look at some of these other films yeah. and see if you don't agree with us. Think about Toy Story. That's it for this special show. Next week, we'll be back with reviews of some of the first films of 1996, including Two of By Sea, starring Sandra Bullock and Dennis Leary in a romantic comedy caper about bumbling thieves. And also, Eye for an Eye, starring Sally Field and Ed Harris in a thriller about a vigilante mob. That's next week. And until then, the balcony is closed.